Hello, everyone. My name is Lori Zabata. I'm a proud JWU alum and the Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thanks so much for joining us for today's session titled SIP with JWU, Finding Your Way Through Chardonnay. We're excited to bring this program to you virtually and look forward to this walkthrough of the history, styles, tasting, and pairing notes of a classic Chardonnay. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. With the exception of the presenters, all participants have been muted. Please leave your cameras turned off until the tasting portion of the presentation. When directed, if you'd like to turn your camera on, please do so. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the chat feature. We will refer to this section to take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Set your view to speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. This will be the best way to see our presenter. During the presentation portion, we suggest selecting show small active speaker video as the view, which is the middle option on the top left of the menu items. I'd like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes for tonight's session, especially Lauren Anderson, manager of alumni relations for her work to bring this program to us. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenter, Mark DiMarchena. Proud JWU alum from the class of 1988 and associate professor within the College of Food Innovation and Technology, where he teaches foundation and capstone courses within the beverage world. Some courses he teaches are foundations of wine, spirits mixology management, contemporary restaurant operations management, and sommelier capstone. He has also led student study abroad programs to Europe, the Azores, and Madeira. Mark is a longstanding member of the Society of Wine Educators, where he serves as a member of their board of directors and where he earned his certified wine educator and certified specialist of spirits achievements. Mark holds additional certifications, including Bordeaux tutor and beer server from the Cicerone organization. Prior to joining the faculty at Johnson & Wales University in 1998, Professor DiMarchena managed food and beverage operations at a variety of hotels national parks and inns across the US. His involvement in the food and beverage industry spans four decades and has afforded him the opportunity to work with great teams, creating unique dining moments and profitable businesses. We are so grateful to have him and his level of knowledge at JWU, and I'm thrilled to have him with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor DiMarchena. Hi, Lori, we're gonna get all the technology going here and see what we got and hi how's everybody we've got all this technology in places where we're not used to having it and so i'm going to get the little presentation going and i have to remember to share my screen is that correct i have to share my screen first thank you for your patience there we go you guys are great. I hope you all have your wine prepared and you're ready to rock and roll. And I appreciate Lori's uh, getting us started. Here we go. Hi, welcome to Casa de Marchena. It's very nice to see you all today. Um, I wish I could like see everybody at once. to be really pretty cool. So thank you for taking some time today. Uh, thank you, Lori, for the great introduction. Thank you, Lauren, Emma. Liza for all your help in the background. And this is gonna be our first attempt at Sip with Jay Wu. So I hope you're ready with some vino, some glasses, etc. cetera. Uh, I have this fun picture up as a sort of welcome to Sip, if you will, because it's, you know, it's an alumni event. So we're trying to connect everybody from all around the world. And I, I think I saw one of our distant students uh, or alumni from Turkey actually sign in. Hi, Denise. Uh, very cool, but um, I wanted to share with you some of my colleagues. Uh, we were hard at work last summer. We're not doing the same fun stuff that we did uh, last summer, this summer, but on the far right of the photo, you may see some of my colleagues from Charlotte, the fabulous Catherine Ram, the superior Sarah Malik, also known as the wine queen. You may be able to see her next month. Um, from our North Miami campus, we've got fabulous Gershwin Neradu, uh, surrounding our host that day, we were hosted by Steve Lohr of J. Lohr Vineyards, who's the next generation of the winemaking family. Uh, we have from the Providence campus, Katrina Harold on the right and Linda Patine on the left. And just behind Linda, we have Stacy Grice from the Denver campus. 
And then our dearly retired friend, Ed Corey, Professor Ed Corey is relaxing in Florida at the moment. Um, and then myself hanging out. Notice we're all wearing bright orange because it's the only way to go to a winery. Um, so we're gonna get together today and try and explore the world of Chardonnay. In our exploration, seeing it's our first virtual wine tasting, I hope you were all able to get to Best Buy and purchase the new formatted router wine device that everybody should have in their home, right? If only it was that easy. You call your internet people and say, hey, can I have some white wine and red wine directed uh, right to my internet? So let's see what we got. Um, hopefully you've done the shopping. I wanna make sure that we are set up to enjoy. Um, I have two wines for you. We have the Charles and Charles from 2016 and we have the J-Lor J. Lor Riverstone from 2018. Hopefully you've got some glassware. Maybe you printed the, the tasting sheet. I've got one that I don't have to move around because you're feeling a little geeky. That's right, you're gonna write notes. Awesome, can't wait. And then hopefully you've got your wine open. Uh, that way we can move right along and enjoy as we can. Keep the corks to the side and see what kind of tasting we can create. So besides having the physical mise en place, we need to try and consider the little secret message, probably the most common way wine is misserved out in the real world, whether it be at our home, at a restaurant, or wherever we may have wine. Uh, often it's served at the wrong temperature. So I'll give you this little quick slide as a way to sort of think things through. The lighter the body of the wine, typically the cooler we serve it. Um, and then work our way up to the very warm, which is my, uh, 65 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. I chose to avoid centigrade, not to make anything confusing. That's my first accent of the evening. I, hopefully it wasn't too painful. Um, I haven't been able to do them at home recently. I'm not, I don't wanna drive my wife crazy. Anyways, so, most of us are gonna chill our wine in the fridge. My fridge is right over there. And when we think of that, the wine's probably coming out at 40 degrees if we've given it enough time to chill. So when you bring it out, you may need some time for it to get into the sweet spot. We are drinking sort of medium body wines today. So we wanna be in the 45 to 55. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that if you wanna get more flavor, you're gonna to go to the higher end of the range. If you want a little less flavor, you wanna simplify the taste, keep it at the cooler side, and then you're gonna have a little fun with that. So I've got mine out. Um, I have done the quick pre-taste to make sure no corking has occurred, and we are ready to go. So let's get a little more information. I don't know what apparatus you chose for today, but um, there's so many to choose from. I use uh, the world famous Captain's Key. It's one of my favorite and um, did the job. So please make sure your wines are open at this point um, and do not spill it on your keyboard. That always leads to bigger challenges. So whether you're using the captain's key, the ASL, the wing device from hell from 1950, 1960, 1970, why won't they stop making that thing? And then the ultimate, I don't know if they make it in a solar version, but the powered corkscrew, yeesh. I got mine at Home Depot. Anyways, this is not a commercial. We're going to keep moving along. So welcome to Chardonnay. Is it your favorite wine? Um, it can be. I love Chardonnay in a certain style. I like the crisper, steelier style. But uh, there's so many versions. So hopefully today, three things we can do to sort of get to know Chardonnay in a better way is can we review its styles? What are the sort of main ways that it presents itself? And then identify the flavors, aromas, maybe the tastes that actually can be associated with those styles. And then you, you, you can go use that knowledge when you're out shopping to maybe find what you really like to taste. Please don't be afraid to make a mistake. That's the best part about wine drinking. You can keep sampling and see what's out there. Um, you know, if you hit a bad bottle or a bottle that you don't like, go back to your wine person and see if you can find something new. It's a fabulous way to travel the globe without having to deal with customs. 
maybe you heard that joke in my class. It's really old. Anyways, we'll keep moving. So for this um, SIP with J Loop program, we created a recommendations process. Yes, I borrowed some information from the wine enthusiast folks or some other magazines out there. So we have three categories that we're gonna stick in. Um, we start with the easiest one on the wallet. That's right, the best buys. So we're searching for yummy flavor under $10. And I know if you hit that sweet spot or I hit that sweet spot, I may be dancing inside the shopping aisle. That's usually when security gets called over. Like, oh, we have a man dancing in the aisle. Always an awkward moment. I just show him my wine membership card and I'm out like a flame. So the second level is called a value level. This is also a great deal kind of game because we're between 10 and $25 and we're hoping we're bringing more flavor and great character to the game, again, without really breaking the wallet. However, there are some times out there where we really want to splurge. I call that the let's splurge section. And hey, we're ready to go a little bit above $30. And I can tell you folks in the Chardonnay world, you can go way above $30. Um, and that might be a fun experience, you know, something that there's a special occasion that you want to celebrate or share and you want to bring a wine that maybe communicates that. So that's a, one of the best parts about Chardonnay. You can find it at every level and really have fun with it. Um, I know when I first started buying Chardonnay for hotels, I found it a most confusing wine because everyone seemed to taste different. So with practice, we can get better at that. So this slide is going to ask you a question. We're going to put a polling question on the screen and ask you, hey, there it is. What's it say? How do you choose the wines that you drink at home? There are four choices. I couldn't add like 900 choices. I would have loved that. But if you can touch the screen and select the answer that you think, oh my God, on my other screen, I can see the amazing results. Some of you may ask your wine store. Some of you are totally cool with your friends talking to you. Some of you are into wine ratings. I'm sorry, I, I'm, you know, I love it, but I'm, it's not something I do often. And then we have the dartboard method. You are the fearless hunter in the liquor store. I love a good fearless hunter. So the winner is you ask your wine store. And that means you all must be wine pros because I think that's one of the best ways to go. Even though I played the certification game and I've you know, learned a lot about wine and enjoy and continue to enjoy exploring. You know, the person who's running the, the wine store, liquor store, often has a bigger or broader opportunity to taste wines that are brought into the store. So never be afraid to ask them. Um, you might have to find the right member. Like uh, I know one of our local stores, they have someone who focuses on beer, someone who focuses on spirits, another person who focuses on, on wine. So find the person who's in charge of the topic you're interested in and ask them. So it says I can share results. I don't know about that. So I'm gonna leave that alone and just go to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about what is Chardonnay? Where is Chardonnay? Did you know Chardonnay is French? What? Impossible. Yes, those French are trying to own the wine world. How do they do that? So. This is one of the cool parts about Chardonnay, and again, referring to, you know, not beating up your passport. You can go to your wine store and travel the globe with this one little happy grape, which is pretty amazing. So to begin with, Chardonnay originates in France. We say that specifically, we would dial into Bourgogne, or that lovely place we call the American say, what, what, Bourgogne, what the heck is that? Uh, don't you mean Burgundy, son? So Burgundy is the home of Chardonnay. And what's really cool is just a couple hours north is another region called Champagne. I'm sure you've heard of it. And uh, it is also known for using that lovely grape. So what's cool about this in Burgundy, I'm going to find Chardonnay generally presented in its still form. And in Champagne, I get to have it in that oh so exciting form the Michael Buble of wines. Yes, a sparkling, lovely, luscious, very refreshing way to start any meal or evening. So 
if you want to play a game and buy some Chardonnays and sort of explore the globe with some friends, uh, socially distanced, of course, or not, not socially distanced, it's the wrong term. We got to get rid of that and go to physically distanced. So they can be in the same room, we just have to be spread apart. So we all could have our own bottle and then rotate stations and explore the world of Chardonnay. Chardonnay, Chardonnay, sorry. Thought I was in that, Rhode Island, Vermont. So if you are in Champagne and you, you do want a sparkling wine made from Chardonnay, you're gonna to need to learn three words, blanc de blanc, meaning white of white. So it's kind of cool, it tells you that it's made from white grapes and Chardonnay is the primary white grape of Champagne. Because it's done so well in France, other countries in the old world, Italy, Spain, uh, all throughout will find fabulous ways. Even England is making wine with Chardonnay. Unbelievable. What will those British do again? So it's amazing. This grape is just traveling everywhere. And so in the old world, we recognize France as sort of the homeland, but other countries in Europe have found unique ways to present Chardonnay and really make it show its stuff. However, if you want to leave what we call the old world and go to the new world, because we live in the new world, hello, California, and enjoy some of this fabulous stuff from a local perspective, we, of course, are going to fall in love with the West Coast from Washington to Oregon to California. The hard part is getting to know the smaller sort of regional names that might dial you into more character or a better deal. So generally, if your wine label says California on it, it means the grapes could have come from anywhere in that massive state. So as a wine hunter, I'm looking for more specific locations. So if it says Napa Valley, all the grapes have to come from Napa Valley. Um, and then of course, there's some less known or other areas that make great Chardonnay, Santa Barbara, Monterey, Fabulous Paso Robles. So, the more you can learn about the smaller locations, the more skilled you may be as a sort of Chardonnay hunter, if you will. Um, don't let the United States be the only place you explore for Chardonnay. Of course, we can go due south and visit Chile and Argentina and find some treats. Of course, we can head eastward and land in South Africa and find some lovely versions of Chardonnay, sort of a blend of old world, new world winemaking. And then of course we can go to Ananda and be crikey crazy, look all over Australia or New Zealand and find some great samples. I apologize, I see Australia, I have to do that. It's so uncontrollable, I'm trying to work through that through therapy. Anyways, <clears throat> so Victoria is an awesome zone in Australia, Western Australia, the um, Margaret River is fabulous. And of course, if you're you know, tired from wine drinking, you need a small 700 mile off swim, go southeast to New Zealand, and you can find some neat examples there. I, I would be remiss in not mentioning the very little tip of Australia, that little island called Tasmania, has some fabulous versions of crisper, sparkling Chardonnay entities that you might want to explore. Might be a little harder for us to find, but it'd be an exciting treat to explore. So, you can go to so many places to enjoy your Chardonnay. It's very, very cool. So, Chardonnay, what flavors come to mind? I'm not gonna move the slide. This is gonna be our second polling question. I'm looking forward to seeing what you all can tell me about what you experience. Here's our second poll. So I know there can be so many different flavors, but I tried to generalize. Do you find Chardonnay screams green apple to you? Is it more about piña? Is it the oak barrel? Or are you in the land of butter? That's right, you left Wisconsin and went to California to find real butter, because cows are happy in California. So it looks like you all are rocking and rolling here. 45% are leaning towards green apple, 45% are leaning towards butter, and then another, wow, just a tiny bit down, I've got oak barrels. So we almost have a three-way tie, which is pretty cool. And oak barrels wins with a lead of 
butter and green apple come into a close second at 41% and almost nobody's digging the pineapple. How many of you were pineapples? Five out of 32. Well, thank you very much for participating. That's pretty awesome. Um, I can share those results and those are now on your screen, I think. So stop sharing and I want to, oops, sorry, move too fast. So I do not know how to make this little thing. I am seeing a different, I need to move the poll question because it's in my way. So when we talk about have Chardonnay. Day, man. Thanks. Uh, hey, somebody's talking. Anyways, when we talk about Chardonnay, um, when we talk about any grape, we usually talk about what fruit is that grape sort of presenting first. And then we move on into say, maybe what the winemaker does. And then after the winemaker, we look at what kind of aging conditions or how did it develop in the bottle. So when people look at Chardonnay, and it can grow in you know really cool places in France to really uh, warmish cool places in the United States and around the New World, we see a range of fruits. And typically, green apple uh, is the marker when it comes from a cooler climate. As it comes from a riper climate, you can see those fruits go from they leave apple and they move on into the star fruit. For me, I use the word pineapple as a, a pretty regular marker that I use when I find a, a Chardonnay that was grown from a really warm climate where the fruit was really able to uh, ripen to the highest level. So often we start with fruit character. Then our next step is what did the winemaker do? So how did they impact it? Did they choose a particular yeast. Our two wines here, the winemakers played some games with yeast to add complexity. Did they use a particular method of fermentation? Do they like it to sit in a tank? Do they like to sit in a barrel? How did they do it? And then of course, when it's done, did they let it sit and age in a barrel or just age in stainless steel, which would be more neutral? So there's so many magical things a wine team can do to add flair, flavors um, to your wine. And usually we see these flavors, or if we want to go another step and say layers, when we see more complexity and more layers of flavor, aroma, and character, we typically also see the price start to rise. And this is a way to say, hey, if I got a lot of layers of flavor and character, but I paid a really reasonable price, maybe that was an awesome value. And it's one way to look at things. Now I'll move to the next slide. So I only gave you a couple simple sort of words for, for that poll for you to choose from. Um, but here I put some words on the screen that a lot of, a lot, I've heard a lot of people use when they talk about Chardonnay. Um, the first one on the top left there, biscuit, and you could say brioche or yeasty. And if I heard those when talking about Chardonnay, my mind would immediately go to a particular style. So what I want to do with this slide is sort of take these words, connect them to a style, and then boom, you all leave the room before we taste the wine. That way I get to taste more. And then you go to the liquor store and you find a better deal. I don't know. No, we can taste together. It's okay. So biscuit and brioche are just uh, a unique term that we find with a particular style. If I work down the left side of the slide to chalky and stony, um, I'm thinking of a word called mineral, which some people don't want to talk about. And that's a whole nother virtual tasting seminar. And as I work further down, tropical fruit's going to hint to me that I'm coming from a really great sunny place where ripening happens easily. As I work to the middle, I see creamy and rich. And my brain starts to think in the Chardonnay world, did they do something to create these sort of added elements to the body. And then on the far right, you see butter, because butter's better. I love butter. Or you could say dairy. So butter and dairy are every wine student's like go-to. This was the easiest one we could pass on our blind tasting test. If we got the butter and dairy, we knew we could call it Chardonnay. Um, and this is a really cool winemaking process, which I'll introduce you to in a second. And then, of course, at the very bottom right, you have spice, vanilla, and wood. Um, and all of those things can uh, present themselves in unique ways. So let's add a layer to that. 
if I could. There we go, there's my magic layer. And what I've done is I've given you some green sort of highlighted circles to connect with the words of character that are on the slide. So starting with brioche, usually that refers to a Chardonnay that's gone through a sparkling wine process because it's had a little extra time to hang out with Captain Yeast. Yeast, our little secret invisible friend who makes wine possible. That's right, very, very important character. So we get the biscuity and the brioche element from that yeast contact that happens in the sparkling wine uh, making process. And it's kind of yummy. And it evolves as that wine sits on those yeast cells. On the bottom right, we have a, a pretty distinct category of Chardonnay, which is more in the newer side of trends. We call it unoaked Chardonnay. Most people see Chardonnay and they think oak, the other side of the slide. But unoaked is a way to, for the winemaker to either focus on the place where the wine came from, and that's where that chalky stony, or yes, you know what I'm gonna say, what am I gonna say? It's that T word, terroir, that's right. We're gonna break out the French word for the flavor of the place. Very cool. So certain Chardonnays, Chablis specifically, are all about the flavor of the place. But then there can be unoaked versions that are really about expressing how well that fruit ripened. And that's why I threw the tropical fruit out in there. In the middle of the slide, I know I'm going to get some wise uh, comments about this. I call it the hybrid wine. No, it's not made by Toyota or Honda. This is a wine that is sort of in the middle of the road and demonstrates character from both sides of the slide. Uh, maybe it's ripe enough where it can get a little bit winemaking or additional winemaking techniques to make it funky. Um, but it's in the middle of the road and it might be a great place to start if you're exploring Chardonnay. On the top right, there's that, I don't know if you like it, if you didn't like terroir, you're not going to like the word malolactic fermentation. But I love malolactic fermentation, A, because it's helpful during tests, and B, because it's malolactic, right? Yes, you're saying this to yourself, I can see. That's two words in one, malolactic. So malolactic is a process that makes the green apple crispness of the wine convert to, you said it, lactic, don't go buttery on me. That's right. It changes the wine from its crisp, light texture into more of a rich, creamy, dairy, butter note. And that's, you know, some people love that. I, I still remember one of my favorite times in class was tasting with students and they had a Chardonnay and they had a little bread and a little bit of goat cheese and a shell. And they're like, uh, I tasted it. And I'm like, you guys are all gonna say one thing. And I wrote down on a piece of paper, the word butter popcorn, I folded it up, put it down and the students, wrote down their words on the page, and we agreed. It was all buttered popcorn. There was a note on the screen and I missed it. Anyways, so very, very cool stuff. Um, oak is the probably most predominant character you see in Chardonnays, and it's fun, it's cool, it adds layers. Sometimes, I know the French have made jokes of us, they're saying, if you're going to drink California Chardonnay, bring tweezers, because you need to remove the wood from your tongue. And it's a little wine sarcasm from the new from the old world, but it's neat when it's done in a way that uh, you can enjoy. So, what's in our glass today? We have two Chardonnays from the United States. I, I figured keep it simple and hopefully make it something that you can find. So we have the Columbia Valley in Washington, and then we have a more specific location called Arroyo Seco, which is inside the Monterey Valley, which is of course inside California. Um, stylistically, both wine companies said they're doing something a little different. I don't know if you have wine number one set up. Go ahead and pour a glass. And I'm going to pour my second just so it's ready. And I'm using the world famous Johnson & Wales wine tasting glasses. That's right. You can read it right there. Um, you can use your tasting sheet if you like. A great way to remember what we're doing is just follow that. We're gonna go from sight to smell to palate to conclusion. I'll say that again in a second. Um, so as we are going through, feel free to type into your, you know, when we smell and we taste, feel free to type into the chat board, you know, any particular characters that are screaming at you. Um, I think that's, you know, the best way we can try and connect. 
And then we will take some questions at the end, um, as long as I don't run late. There you go. So our first wine is from the Columbia Valley. It's a nice little picture of it. It's a big giant desert space just east of the Cascade Mountains. So if you take a car ride from Seattle, you're gonna drive east about three or four hours. And it's massive. It's one of the biggest wine regions in the United States. And this wine is made by Charles and Charles. So we can say Charles the first one in an American slang, and we can say Charles in the second time because it's from France. So it's two families that have connected, Charles Smith and Charles Bidet, that are working together to make this really cool wine. There they are, that's Chuck and Chuck. I don't know if they like to be called Chuck, but I'm gonna risk it. So, what I ask you to do, uh, let me introduce the second wine and then we'll do the taste. I don't wanna get ahead of myself. So, wine number two, uh, we were hosted by Steve Lohr last summer and we were actually in the Paso Robles wine facility and we actually drove through the Monterey Valley and passed where this wine was made. So this is the J. Lore um, Arroyo Seco Monterey Chardonnay. It also is called Riverstone. Um, that's sort of a branding name. The map just highlights for you where exactly um, the AVA, which is the American term for identifying smaller sections of wine zones. Um, and it's really a beautiful place. I don't know if you can see at the top of the map, uh, the map, the valley heads north and it sort of opens up onto Monterey Bay, which is one of the coolest temperature spots of all the Pacific Ocean. And this provides really awesome cool temperatures that this, the grapes in this region take a long, slow time to ripen. So you get sunshine, but then you get air conditioning at night. And that creates the most perfect way for grapes to ripen in some cases. Uh, what it leads to, I, I was looking on the label, this wine was not harvested until October 4th. And that's a really long ripening period. And that leads to a lot of character and flavor. So if you're hunting for Chardonnays in California, it's just a little sidebar. Um, the, the coast south of San Francisco, working down to Santa Barbara, what we call the central coast, you would hit um, Monterey, uh, Santa Barbara, Paso Robles. These are really, really cool hidden zones to find some great Chardonnay. Bink. And there's Jerry Lohr and his family. So Jerry's the guy in the aqua shirt in the middle, and he's got his three kids who are pretty much running the winery now. He started as an engineer, like in South Dakota, and bada boom, he's one of the leading winemakers of California and the United States. Pretty cool to see what people do. So on the left, you have Larry, then Steve, who hosted us last year, Jerry, and Cynthia. Really cool. So wine number one, let's work our magic. That's right, we've got to do sight, smell, sip, and savor. We're gonna break out our four S's. Um, so hopefully you've got a nice glass, something easy to work with. Woo, yeah, this one's a little smaller, I overfilled it. So what I'd like you to do is just bring it to your nose and breathe in gently. Um, you've got to find sort of the sweet spot. Do you get the smell far from your face? Do you have to bring your nose closer or do you have to bring your nose all the way in? But when you are close enough where you feel that you're getting the wine's character, but it's not overwhelming you, breathe in gently. What does it make you think of? Let your mind wander, let it form a picture. Maybe it reminds you of something. So I'm immediately getting tropical fruit. For me, this is talking and speaking of pineapple. Um, Sometimes your nose may get overwhelmed. Feel free to smell the back of your hand. If you're not wearing too much Paco or cocoa, it'll help you to neutralize your nose and get you ready to sniff some more. So if you get one smell that dominates, take a second and try and adapt and see if there's anything else going on here. So for me, there's a little bit of dairy, light cream, uh, maybe like a brie cheese. And then there's a hint of spice, like baking spice and oak in the background. So from the smell, I can get a lot of fun stuff with what's going on here. Um, go ahead and take a sip. What I'd like you to do, refresh your mouth. We've been sort of, I've been talking, you've been breathing. Just refresh your mouth, go ahead and swallow that sip. This sip, I want, I wish we could put like everybody's sound on at once and hear you gurgle. 
I want to hear some crazy wine gurgling. So put it in your mouth, uh, like a small tablespoon, breathe in, and, and not enough so like you're gagging, but breathe in so that you expand the flavor and go ahead and make a little sound. Hey, we have a gargler, not a gurgler. What was that? Oh my goodness, that's pretty awesome. I hope you got a lot out of that. Even after you swallow the wine, if you breathe in, it keeps speaking to you. So again, I think the tropical fruit is there, but it's not the most, it's not the first thing that speaks to me. I get sort of a raw nut character, or again, the creaminess of brie, um, and then some oak in the background, spice, and it's a little, if you breathe in quickly, you might find it's a little spicy, and that could be the sense that this is 13.9% alcohol. So pretty cool. Um, try and get a sense of, all right, when we say savor, how was I impacted with that? I mean, you can go with this typical of like, I liked it, I didn't like it. You can get critical if you like, or you can just say, hey, this is a wine I would have one glass, this is a wine I'd have two, this is a wine I'd buy the bottle, or this is a wine I'd buy the case. That's sort of the Mark D. Marchena method of rating. Uh, one glass, two glass, bottle, or a case. And uh, see where you put it. So I'm gonna put that to the side. Just some little highlights here. Uh, this wine did get barrel fermented. So they put yeast with the wine juice inside the barrel and it created character in that environment. Uh, only 20% of the wine did that. 80% of the wine was fermented in stainless steel. So he also did something kind of unique. Most, ye most wines use a commercial yeast to make and cause fermentation. He used a small amount of natural yeast to try and add a layer of complexity. Kind of cool, kind of creative for a wine that usually sits below $10. So Neat little expression. Thank you, Charles and Charles. This again from Washington State from the Columbia Valley. Um, now we're gonna step back. We're gonna go down the coast and creep into California um, and explore the J. Lore Riverstone. So I'm gonna move my slide to number two. So this wine is exactly the same alcohol. This is 13.9 as well, um, but the wine people did some, some different things to express what they believe should go into this bottle. So again, the brand name is called Riverstone. And if you would, just take a look. I know I rushed through the look last time, so maybe it's cool to put them side by side. They're pretty similar in color. Maybe the Riverstone's a touch uh, brighter. But um, go ahead and take a whiff. And Sometimes this is, this is one of my favorite things is when you have wines and glasses next to each other, it gives you the, the ability to compare. I love that. I mean, when we go to a restaurant, we're enjoying it with our food and we're not really comparing. But when we can put multiple glasses in front of us, it's neat to go back to one and then go to two. And it's a fantastic way to see how things are different. It's right there in front of you. So again, smell the back of your hand to neutralize. Um, and then see what you get. If you want to swirl it carefully, and I don't know if you guys are counterclockwise swirlers or if you're British, it's anti-clockwise, or if you're a clockwise swirler, it's really up to you. So I'm just gonna check my watch and see that we are, okay. So this one, the, the fruit doesn't scream at me in the nose. I get more of the winemaking elements, um, the fermentation character, a little bit of the barrel. And so I'm gonna taste it now and see where that goes. After you swallow, breathe in so you can actually continue to live through the experience. So what does it mean if your mouth's watering? So maybe you're in the front of your mouth, it's you're salivating, maybe it's time to eat because we're hungry, but um, it definitely suggests the wine has got good acidity. If you run your tongue along your gums or on the roof of your mouth, you'll probably sense that it's pretty slick. So there's no real tannin here, there's good acidity, so it refreshes the mouth, it makes you want to take a second sip. 
So what flavors came to mind? How did this wine talk to you in regards to flavor? I can't hear it. I'm sorry. That was a bad joke. So I think this one's fruit was much brighter in the mouth compared to number one. Um, it was a livelier fruit. I think the balance with the oak and the fermentation characteristics are also more together. Um, it makes, it definitely makes me want to take a second sip, maybe a bottle sip, where this wine, it leads me a little bit more towards, uh, it has a bit of a bitter finish. This one has a fruitier character. I think the balance between sweet and bitter are a little bit better. So what's pretty amazing, the J. Lore folks, they use nine different subversions, which we call clones. So they use nine clones of Chardonnay to make this wine. And they, they fermented it in a barrel. 50% uh, of it was fermented in a barrel. And that was done for seven to nine months. And anything from new oak to barrels that have actually no flavor, they're just neutral, where we can get the oxygen characteristics into our wine. And this wine had 50% MLF. 50% malolactic fermentation. Would you say either of these is really bitter? I'm sorry, buttery? I don't think so. I think it's more they're both on a creamy note. I gotta try this again. Awesome, very tasty. And they have a lot of similarities, but uh, when it comes to the overall balance, I think number two is a little more complete. So. I hope you all got to taste the same wines, or if you explored a different Chardonnay, maybe your experience was a whole nother view. So when we're done tasting, I mean, when we're doing it in a professional way or we're evaluating, we're gonna take all these components, sort of the site, the aroma, the taste, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, umami, and then the flavor and the texture, and we're gonna form an impression. So that's what I think if you add all those things together, um, we're going to come up with what it equals. I mean, maybe we should actually put another blue box on there and put price because, you know, price can really impact for us what we think the value is. So I probably should have poll, uh, put a poll here. I didn't think of that to say which, which wine did you prefer. Hopefully you like them both um, and you'll have a good reason to continue tasting them. Of course, if we are tasting wine, we should be blending in a little bit of food. And uh, the opportunity here is pretty broad. Um, white wines have a lot of flexibility because they have good acidity or good uh, crispness, which refreshes our palate. And usually what I try to do is just start with intensity. If this is what I would call medium power, I would try to match it with medium or lighter powered foods. Um, I would also try and say, hey, these guys sort of have a, a sour, bitter character. So let me see if I can counter them. My biggest hint for you is to sort of blend or, or use sour foods and salty foods as they are the easiest to pair. Um, the main rule of thumb is that food will change the character of your wine. And it's a really cool experiment to do the where you have the wines, you taste them, then you go grab a particular food, and then after putting the food in your mouth, see how it changes the wine. That will give you a great way to start building some expertise at food and wine pairing. So if we were in the liquor store, and of course they don't allow us to take a free sample, um, but we use the labels to try and guide us, were these labels helpful? And so on the Chuck and Chuck, Charles and Charles wine, um, they very simply said this is a pure, full-flavored, yet beautifully balanced wine. They didn't give us much. Um, so maybe our expectations weren't much, and then you'd have a win. On the J. Lore label, they tell us a little bit about the family, and then they go a little deeper into the winemaking. Um, they tell us about river stones, which are these sort of large rocks found in the soil. They're also called greenfield potatoes. And these create a really unique drainage condition, which allows the plant to focus more on making the grapes than on making more plant. So very cool stuff. I think the J. Lor label gives us a little more detail as far as what we're going to get. Um, 
Some of us use the label, some of us don't. It's a nice place to go and refer. But again, if you can ask your liquor store salesperson, you might find it very helpful. So to wrap things up, I'm just gonna say here, if you can connect what the flavors and the aromas you experience in today's wines and connect them to one of the five styles that I've placed on the screen, you might have a useful tool to go and speak to your particular liquor, wine, spirit, beer vendor and find the selection that sort of makes you happy. So it's, it's really a fun thing to do. I mean, I don't know if you go out and buy the same wine all the time because you, you're going to feel confident about a particular brand. Um, it's one way to shop and it's fun. You know what you're going to get. It's also exciting to explore. Um, so don't be afraid to speak to your wine vendor and find new opportunities, whether they be in the world of Chardonnay or they be in the world of other wine grapes. There's so many ways to have fun with wine. So hopefully today you were able to take a little bit and recognize, even though these two are very similar in style, uh, we could probably put out seven glasses. That would have been a whole different virtual tasting um, to try and identify how each style is unique. But ask your wine vendor, look for different samples, do this again with broadly different samples and see what you can find. Hopefully you can sort of dial into a style that you like and you can continue to have fun enjoying Chardonnay. Connect the flavors that you like and don't be afraid to share those with your um, wine store vendor. They can be very helpful as well. And then as you go out there and enjoy, um, keep track of what you find exciting and uh, share it with people you, you, you know and love. It's, uh, we have a very dear friend that, uh, we all worked with all the faculty at Johnson and Wales have worked with uh, outside in the wine business. She's a fantastic Italian wine specialist, Sharon McCarthy, and she put it as simple as this. Wine is about pleasure, and I really think that's what the focus should be. Uh, so good food, good wine, good company, even if it's through a Zoom chat, <laughs> it can be a great time. So we're going to take some questions and answers. I think Liza's going to throw on the screen and see if she can share any detail with me. Um, and I'll be glad to answer any questions I can for anybody. So we have one question. Um, Lucinda wants to know any NYS Chardonnays would you recommend that we try? That, I mean, hi Lucinda. Is it the Lucinda I think it is? Hey, how are you? Good to see you. I Hi. <laughs> uh, so cool. Um, I think that is sort of the secret. Um, you know, everybody talks about California and Oregon and Washington, but I think if you head eastward, uh, you can find some wonderful treats on Long Island. I mean, yeah, the North Fork has got some fun wine to explore. I mean, I still love the Chardonnay that Westport does. Westport Rivers in Massachusetts, of course, has an amazing sparkling program and they feature Chardonnay. Um, they, the, the East Coast definitely does Chardonnay. I think they do it in a crisper format. You can also, of course, explore New York's Finger Lakes, which I know everyone says is all about Riesling, but there's some really cool opportunities up there and through New York State as well whether you be in the North Fork or in the Finger Lakes, I think you can find some really cool examples, maybe not as oak and butter driven, but crisp and fruity and yummy nonetheless. That's cool. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, why should we travel to California if we can get it in our backyard, right? Yes, thanks. Anyone else have questions? Um, Elizabeth? Elizabeth wants to know, what is your favorite dish to pair with Chardonnay? So I am ridiculed for not being the biggest seafood lover. Um, uh, it might, if I'm going with a crisp, so first Elizabeth, we've got to start at style and say, all right, if we're in the crisp sort of Chablis, where it's all about stone and terroir, um, and maybe you're just going to go down to the East, uh, East Matunic and go to the Matunic Oyster Bar and have some fresh shucked oysters. Uh, again, if you're having it with a mignonette sauce, that little bit of acidity is going to make the 
uh, wine itself seem a little richer and fruitier, which is kind of cool. Um, again, in the crisp style, if I have a lightly fried calamari, again, the weights sort of balance each other. The calamari is not too intense. I know a lot of people love Chardonnay with their salmon. Just keep in mind the way you cook the salmon is going to sort of impact its intensity. So the salmon itself has a base intensity, I would say a low medium. But then if you pan sear it or if you uh, roast it in the oven, uh, sort of en papillot or wrapped in foil so the juices stay in, it's going to be more subtle. Uh, maybe you put a flake of butter and some herbs in there. And now you're going to go with more of a medium, uh, more medium style, more rich style Chardonnay. Um, if you go out onto the grill where it's a way more intense cooking, you're going to go with a bigger full body Chardonnay that can bring the power to match the impact of what the grill did to your salmon. Um, always look at your cooking methods, you know, because they add intensity to your food and that will sort of impact what wine you choose. Awesome. Great question. Sarah wants to know if you think Chardonnay works with red meat. I do. I mean, um, yeah, I think you can do that. I think, so if we're talking about, can I have a roast beef sandwich in the afternoon? You know, I've got some nice bread with some um, sort of grain notes, uh, a hearty grain bread that brings on some richness and character and I've sliced thin roast beef. Um, can I use a rich Chardonnay to go with that to make my afternoon lunch a little more exciting? Um, intensity, I don't know if I'm gonna go with a, I mean, a steak is pretty simple in some ways. I mean, you can also take a chicken breast, pan sear it, finish it in the oven, and it's gonna have characteristics of a steak with uh, the way it browns off. And, the, and again, if you've seasoned it well, Again, the salt, if you season any of your grilled meats well, is going to be helpful in connecting to the Chardonnay. I hope that helps. I, I don't think there's, you know, you, you can't, it's always fun to try. People may look at you and they're like, oh my God, you don't have any white wine with the red meat? Oh my God. But it's so cool. It's, you, I mean, and no one should tell you what you like. Only you know what you like. So please enjoy. Should I go put an ice cube in these? Bad joke. We have Any one other last question? question. Yep, one last question. What are the best cheeses to pair with these Chardonnays? Well, um, I was posting on Instagram, and I don't know if you saw, I had an affinois, um, which, you know, a French um, brie style. So very creamy, very buttery. And then, uh, you know, it's not just the cheese, it's what's going with it too. So that crusty baguette, you know, there's, uh, I probably haven't had a baguette in four months, be, you know, but <laughs> maybe I need to go get one. But there's something about the connection. I mean, also goat cheese or the aged goat cheese from Spain, the Grozza. Oh my God, very yummy because it, it just goes to another level of richness. Um, and the cheese doesn't overpower the wine. I don't think I'm going blue cheese land here because I think the intensity of uh, the, you know, the salt crystals in it and the, the bacterial chain elements of the blue would sort of take over. But this is also a fun little game. You get two wines, you get four cheeses, and you play. Like goat cheese is almost always a win because goat cheese is, as I'm sure you all know, goat cheese has more acidity or a lower pH. And that sourness helps to connect with wines in a really great way. But if you haven't tried an aged goat from Spain, Mm, something yummy to do. So, so good. Other questions? We really appreciate you coming out. Uh, I'd like you all, if you could, to applaud the people in the background. Again, Lori, Lauren, Emma, and Liza, thank you so much for all that you did. Uh, this has been a, a fun time working together, and we hope it's the start of something unique for Johnson & Wales and the Alumni Relations Department. Mark, can we ask you one more question from the group? It is but a pleasure. Can you recommend a book to help learn about Chardonnay? Oh, my God. Um, you know, so we're going to post some stuff afterward, 
Um, like I created a little website that's going to have some extra deliverables for you. And so I'm going to, in that I may, I love Madeline Puckett. She runs a website called Wine Folly, winefolly.com. I, I just love her easy approach. So in that uh, website attachment, which is going to be shared with you, I think in the after email, the after event email, um, I've given you the specification sheets for both wines. I've given you the link to uh, Madeline and a particular article uh, uh, that she did on Chardonnays. And then um, I think I also gave you a recent article from April's Wine Enthusiast that sort of says, hooray for Chardonnay, let's look at it on every continent. And it just gives you some more pointers. Again, if you see something in the article and you're like, hey, that's not my price point, buddy, um, then, you know, again, say, I'm looking for the style, hey, Mr. Wine Store person, what can you do for me? And put them to work so they earn your business. Um, as far as a, a textbook, I mean, specifically, um, what was it called? The Wine Bible, we all sort of love. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while, but it's gigantic, but it's very, e very easy to, to read. Um, definitely go look at Wine Folly. It's so much fun. She puts it in a, everything in a way that's just more approachable. Again, wine should be about pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor DiMarchana, for leading us on tonight's tasting experience with Chardonnay. It was great. So informative, fun, interesting. Thank you so much for your time. We're grateful that you shared your time with us tonight and appreciate your insight on wine, uh, this wine variety. Your love for Jewu and your passion for wine education is so appreciated. So thank you so much. This was fantastic. We'd also like to thank all of our alumni attendees for joining us tonight. At the beginning of this presentation, you may have noticed I introduced our presenter as an associate professor in the College of Food Innovation and Technology, or CFED. And you may be thinking, what is that? I've never heard of that college at Jewu. Well, CFED is a landmark interdisciplinary approach to education, meaning we work across areas of expertise to come up with creative methods of problem solving. As the world changes, so does the function of food in society, and CFED will educate and prepare the next generation of culinary and food leaders. We're excited to welcome our students back to campus on July 6th, where they will explore culinary systems within the context of political, social, and economic landscapes, analyzing the impact that food has on all of us. With this knowledge, they will begin developing solutions, practices, and food innovations that make a difference in everyday lives. Today, I invite you to support tomorrow's food and beverage leaders and the evolution of JWU's culinary education with a gift directly to the College of Food Innovation and Technology. If you're in a position to give back, your gift will be put to use immediately as we embark on a new era at JWU. We've shared a donation link in the chat window, and on behalf of our returning students, I thank you so much for your generosity. We sincerely hope you've enjoyed this evening's session, Finding Your Way Through Chardonnay, part of the JWU For You family of programming. Through JWU For You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting, dis interesting discussions related to professional development, social, and avid interest topics. Upcoming events will be posted on our event calendar at alumni.jwu.edu, and we encourage you to check in often. We appreciate your attendance and wish you such a wonderful night. Thank you so much for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you so much, Mark. This was Cheers great. Cheers, all. Cheers. Thank you, Lori. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Cheers.